Welcome to the second lecture of Electrical Engineering 525. In this lecture, we will look at uh, one problem referring to material from section 2.4 and another problem referring to uh, material from section 2.5. So let's start with the uh, problem dealing with section 2.4, which uh, is shown here. It is problem 2.4.8. And this is a relatively simple problem, but it uh, demonstrates an important idea. So the question is the following. It says, using the far field boundary condition of R sub FF equals 2D squared over lambda for a linear antenna of length D, find R sub FF for the following antenna lengths and the lengths that we want to consider are d equals 5 lambda, d equals lambda over 2, and d equals 0 0.01 lambda. And the question is, is the far field distance you computed valid in each case? And if not, why not? Now, uh, first of all, let's make sure we understand exactly what we're talking about. You will recall that in the first lecture, we were calculating radiated fields and we stated that those would be the fields that we would have in the far field. In other words, far away from the antenna. Well, it might have occurred to you at that time, what do we mean by the far field? How far is far? How, in other words, how far away do we have to get from the antenna for those approximations that we were using to be uh, good approximations. Well, that's called the far field and so basically we're wondering where does the far field start? And what this problem is trying to point out to you is that in order to find out where the far field starts for a linear antenna uh, is not sufficient to just check this one criterion of r being greater than 2d squared over lambda. In fact, there are three criteria that you have to check. And so that's what we have right here. It says, what this problem is getting at is the idea that there are actually three criteria that must be met for the far field distance for line sources of length d. And these three criteria are, r must be greater than 2d squared over lambda, R must also be greater than 5D and R must be greater than 1.6 lambda. And depending on what value of D you are considering, we're going to find out that different criteria will be important, will be the most important one for different antennas. So that's why for, um, for each antenna we want to consider, if we want to find out the appropriate value uh, of, of where the far field starts, which is R sub FF, if we want to figure out what that is, we have to check all three criteria. So that's what it's saying here, of course. So for each of the antenna lengths given, we must check all three criteria. So let's look at antenna number one, the one where they said that uh, D, the length of the antenna, is 5 lambda. Okay, well, and um, let me remind you one more time, the three criteria that we're going to check each time are R greater than 2D squared over lambda, R greater than 5D, and R greater than 1.6 lambda. So, when we check the first criterion for this antenna number one, the antenna for which D is equal to five lambda, we get when D is equal to five lambda, the first criterion becomes R is greater, again, than 2D squared over lambda, and that becomes uh, D squared. If D is five lambda, then D squared is 25 lambda squared. So we have two times 25 lambda squared over lambda, which gives us 50 lambda. <coughs> When D is equal to 5 lambda, the second criterion becomes R is greater than 5D, but in this case, since D is 5 lambda, then that's 5 times 5 lambda, or 25 lambda. 
And then f the final criterion, when, when d is equal to 5 lambda, the third criterion becomes, and remember that third criterion is just r must be greater than 1.6 lambda. So if we look here now, the first criterion tells us that r must be greater than 50 lambda. The second criterion tells us that r must be greater than 25 lambda. And the third criterion tells us that r must be greater than 1.6 lambda. And all three of those must be true for us to be in the far field. So what that means is that we have to take the most restrictive criterion which in this case is the first one. R has to be greater than 50 lambda. So as we summarize here, so in this case, the most restrictive criterion is indeed the criterion, the first criterion, which is R is greater than 2D squared over lambda. So in this case, yes, R sub FF is equal to 2D squared over lambda. So for the first antenna, it's fine for us to use this formula, RF, R sub FF equals 2D squared over lambda. That is uh, appropriate for calculating where the far field begins. Now let's consider the second antenna. The second antenna was the um, half wavelength dipole. Uh, and so we have D is equal to lambda over 2. In this case, let's, uh, when we look at the first criterion, uh, remember that is r is greater than 2d squared over lambda, and since d is equal to lambda over 2 in this case, d squared is equal to lambda squared over 4, so we have 2 times lambda squared over 4 divided by lambda which would give us lambda over 2. Uh, for this uh, antenna, the second criterion, which is r must be greater than 5d, becomes r must be greater than 5 times lambda over 2, which is 2.5 lambda. And then the third criterion is uh, that r must be greater than 1.6 lambda, and so that just stays as it is. And now if we look at these three results that we have obtained, we see that in this case, the most restrictive criterion is actually the second one, that R must be greater than 2.5 lambda. And that's summarized here. So in this case, the most restrictive criterion is the second criterion, R greater than 5D. So RFF is equal to 5D is equal to 2.5 lambda. If we had used the formula RFF equals 2D squared over lambda in this case, we would have gotten R sub FF equals lambda over 2, which would have been an incorrect value. So in this formula, uh, this, for this antenna, it is not correct to use the formula R sub FF equals 2D squared over lambda. And now finally, for the antenna of length 0 0.01 lambda, Okay, if D is equal to 0 0.01 lambda, the first criterion becomes, okay, again, R is greater than 2D squared over lambda. So D squared, if D is 0 0.01 lambda, D squared is 0 0.0001 lambda squared. And we multiply that by 2 and divide by lambda, and so we get 0 0.0002 lambda. The second criterion, that R must be greater than 5D, becomes... Uh, R must be greater than 5 times 0 0.01 lambda, which is 0 0.05 lambda. And then the third criterion, of course, is the one that just says that R must be greater than 1.6 lambda. And obviously, the most restrictive criterion in this case is the third criterion, as is stated right here. And so, uh, so we have to take, in this case, the beginning of the far field, R sub FF is equal to 1.6 lambda. And if we had used the formula R sub FF equals 2D squared over lambda in this case, uh, just as in the second case, we would have obtained an incorrect value. And so finally, it notes here that we, a different criterion ended up being the most restrictive criterion in each case. And so that's why all three criteria must be checked for any uh, antenna that we want to consider. And so that concludes uh, problem 2.4.
dash 8. And now we want to uh, look at um, a slightly more challenging problem, uh, which is 2.5 dash 2. This problem states that a power pattern is given by absolute value of cosine to the n of theta. And that's the value of the power pattern for theta between 0 and pi over 2. But for theta between pi over 2 and pi, the value of the pattern, power pattern is identically equal to 0. So again, the power pattern is zero everywhere except between theta equals zero and theta equals pi over two. And in that range, the power pattern is given by absolute value of cosine to the n of theta. And we want to do two things in this problem. We want to A, calculate the directivity for n equals one, two, and three. And B, we want to find the uh, values of the half power beam width in degrees for each value of n. Okay, so as you uh, see in section uh, 2.5, the formula for calculating relating to directivity, one of the formulas, and in this case the most convenient one, is d is equal to 4 pi over omega sub a, where omega sub a is the um, beam solid angle. And that beam solid angle, omega sub a, is defined as the integral over a sphere uh, that encloses the antenna of the absolute value of f of theta phi squared. Actually, I see I left out uh, parentheses there. Let's correct that. So there should be here, there. Okay. Well, <coughs> the absolute value, or, or, or and that's actually magnitude squared of f of theta phi. That's the same thing as p of theta phi. The power pattern. And we're told in this case that the power pattern is the magnitude of cosine to the n of theta. So uh, this is what we get. And notice that we have uh, made a slight distinction here that is important. Okay, For the beam solid angle, you need to integrate over the entire sphere. This, this value of f of theta phi magnitude squared. And similarly, uh, all we've done in going from this equation, from this formula to this uh, next formula, is we have taken, we've just used the fact that the, that this f of theta phi magnitude squared is the same thing as p of theta phi. So there's um, no no trickery here. We're just using the definition of p of theta phi uh, in terms of of f of theta phi. But in going from this formula to this final formula on this line, why have we uh, changed this from the sphere to the top of the sphere? Well, the reason is that uh, in going from this formula to this formula, we're actually plugging in the value for p of theta phi, and we're plugging in this uh, magnitude of cosine in theta, but that's only correct for the top of the sphere. For the bottom of the sphere, p of theta phi is equal to zero, and so we don't have to worry about that part at all. We can just leave that part of the integration out because it would give us a zero anyway. When we integrate zero, we get zero. So we only have to do this integral over the top of the sphere. Okay. Now, having said that, So now, in the next, if we go down to the next line, we go ahead and um, fill in the values necessary to do this integral over the top of the sphere. And uh, the main thing to remember here is that d omega, in this case, since we're in spherical coordinates, d omega 
is equal to sine theta uh, d theta d phi. And um, furthermore, notice that phi is varying from zero to two pi, but since we're only integrating over the top of the sphere, theta uh, goes only from zero to pi over two rather than zero to pi. So that explains this formula, and that is easily simplified. First of all, we note that the integrand does not have anything dependent on phi at all. So when we do this phi integration, everything can be taken out, and we just get the integral from 0 to 2 pi of d phi, and so that gives us a 2 pi, which can be brought out here in the front. So we come over here to hand 2 pi, and then uh, integral from theta equals 0 to theta equals pi over 2 of the absolute value of cosine in theta sine theta d theta. Now we go to the next line. Of course, the 4 pi divided by 2 pi will give us a 2 in the numerator. And um, then we're left in the bottom with the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of the absolute value of cosine n theta times sine theta d theta. And then we have this observation. Remember that the cosine of theta is always greater than or equal to 0 when theta, when theta is between 0 and pi over 2. And, and that's the region we're interested in here. Remember, we're not going to extend beyond pi over 2. So if we're not going beyond theta equals pi over 2, then the cosine theta is always non-negative in this region. But this absolute value of the cosine in theta, well, that's the same thing then as um, just, you know, if cosine theta is always positive, then cosine theta raised to the nth power is always positive. And so that absolute value of cosine in theta is just the same thing as cosine in theta. We don't have to worry about the absolute value signs since we are restricting our attention to the region theta between 0 and pi over 2. So that's what allows us in this next line here, as we're going from, from this line to this line, that's what allows us to drop the absolute value signs. Now, once we have done that, we notice that this integral in the bottom has a simple form. It has the form of u to the n du, almost. We can think of uh, cosine theta as being u, and so this is u to the n, but we don't quite have du because remember, if u is cosine theta, then du is negative sine theta d theta. And so what we need to do uh, to get this exactly in the form of uh, u to the n du, we need to put a negative sign on the inside and then pull a negative sign out. So I'm going to pull, here's the negative sign that comes out. And then since we, uh, once we bring that negative sign out, then we do indeed have integral of u to the n du. And of course, integral of u to the n du will be 1 over n plus 1 u to the n plus 1 power. So here we have the negative sign that we brought out, and then 1 over n plus 1, and here is u to the n plus 1 power. And we're going to evaluate that between the limits of 0 and pi over 2. We come down then to the next line, of course the 2 comes down and the negative 1 over n plus 1 comes down, and then cosine of n plus 1 to the pi over 2, excuse me, cosine to the n plus 1 of pi over 2, well cosine of pi over 2 is 0, and 0 raised to the n plus 1 power is still 0, so at the upper limit we get 0. At the bottom limit, uh, cosine of 0 is 1, and 1 to the n plus 1 power is still 1, so we have uh, subtracting at the lower limit, we get 0 minus 1. And, of course, 0 minus 1 <coughs> is minus 1. And minus 1 times minus 1 is positive 1. So we have 2 divided by 1 over n plus 1. And so that's the same thing as 2 times the quantity n plus 1 or 2n plus 2. So the directivity in this case is 2n plus 2. And therefore, you know, the, when n is equal to 1, the directivity is 4. When n is equal to 2, the directivity is 6. When the, uh, n is equal to 3, the directivity is 8, and so on.
So that's how we get the directivity from this calculation shown right here. And then finally, for the uh, half power uh, beam width here, or, um, the formula for the half power beam width is the uh, absolute value of theta HP left minus theta HP right. Now these are the angles to the left and the right of the uh, main beam maximum. Uh, where uh, the power pattern uh, goes to the normalized power pattern has a value of one half. So uh, we can think about this in the following way. When theta is between zero and pi over two, as we've already noted, in that whole region, cosine theta is positive, which means that cosine theta to the nth power is positive. And therefore, this absolute value of cosine and theta is just cosine and theta. Now, remember, this is, is P. This is the power pattern right here. And as we said just a moment ago, the half power, that's the HP. Remember, that means half power. Or in other words, when the power is one half. So that's why we have set the power here, the power pattern. We're setting that equal to one half, and we want to see at what values of theta that is equal to one half. And the observation we're making here is simply that in the region we're uh, under consideration, cosine theta is always positive, so cosine theta to the nth power will always be positive, and therefore we can drop these absolute values on. So the first step in finding the uh, values of theta is to note then that uh, this restriction or this equation becomes this equation. Cosine of n theta equals one half. And <clears throat> as we noted earlier, of course, you know this, cosine n theta equals one half. That, that's just another way of saying that cosine of theta to the nth power is one half. And then if we raise each side of this equation to the one over n power, we'll get cosine of theta is equal to one half to the one over n power and then take the inverse cosine of both sides of that equation and we get theta is equal to the inverse cosine of one half to the one over n power so this uh, if we now will stick in the appropriate values of n we can find the desired values of theta so for, if you plug in n is equal to one you'll find that the inverse cosine of one half is 60 degrees now the the power pattern in this case this cosine to the n theta absolute value that has a maximum at theta equals zero so our maximum is along the z positive z axis it's um, at theta equals zero degrees and therefore we can think of theta uh, the half power theta to the left as being negative 60 degrees and theta hp to the right as being positive 60 degrees and so when we plug in then for the half power beam width, we get the absolute value of theta HP left minus theta HP right will be absolute value of negative 60 degrees minus 60 degrees, which is absolute value of minus 120 degrees, which is 120 degrees. So the half power beam width for n is equal to 1 is 120 degrees. If we now look at n equals 2, okay, the only difference that makes is we come back up here to this equation and plug in uh, 2 for n and so we get theta is equal to inverse cosine of 1 half to the 1 half power and if you calculate that you'll find out that that is 45 degrees and once again we think of theta, HP as being negative uh, then the uh, excuse me theta HP left is being negative 45 degrees and theta HP right is being 45 degrees. So we'll get HP is equal to absolute value of negative 45 degrees minus 45 degrees, which would be absolute value of negative 90 degrees, which is 90 degrees. And then finally, for n is equal to 3, theta is equal to inverse cosine of 1 half to the 1 third power, which will give you 36.467 degrees. And doing the same kind of calculation as above, the half power beam width in this case will be 74.93 degrees. So 
that's how we calculate the half power beam width uh, for um, this power pattern. And um, that concludes our discussion of these two problems.